would he want to leave with his students um, as part of a lecture series that Carnegie Mellon has. And um, it turned out that for Randy Pasha, that ended up being his, truly his last lecture. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, um, terminal cancer. And he gave his last lecture, and our students were able to read it. Um, super meaningful book, I think um, lots of all of us would say. We just, uh, you got to learn um, just a lot of powerful life lessons from it. And so this year, seniors voted on which teacher they would want to have give them their last lecture as you sit here. And um, the teacher that you decided to honor with that is Mr. Ray Sigworth. And so uh, I invite Mr. Sigworth up here to see, uh, give us his words of wisdom. <laughs> Zippers up, so we're good to go. <laughs> Last week, Mrs. Dunn asked me if I would be willing to do this, and uh, I was flattered, and I was obviously I agreed to, to do so, and I was happy to do so. And we talked for a little while, and as I was walking out of the school, this element of panic entered me. Because there are a handful of you, of you seniors in this room that, that haven't been, I haven't had the privilege to teach. But most of you, I've had for a year, two years, some of you I've had for three years. And I'm thinking, is there a story or a metaphor or an analogy that I have ever, that they haven't heard? And I'm afraid the well was dry. And I'm trying to come up with this story, and, and I got in my car, and I turned the radio off, which I never do. I turned the radio off, and on the drive home, I just started thinking, um, you know, how Mrs. Dunn explained the book. Now, Randy Posh, the book was filled with these, these little stories of sometimes very minute things that happened in his life. And he was able to tie a larger life lesson into it that he could pass on to his kids. And he put all these little clever little titles to all these stories. And I'm like, okay, I need to come up with something that has happened to me in my life that I can uh, I can tie some sort of a life lesson to, and I gotta come up with a cute little title. And, and it, my, my mind was just racing. And as my mind was racing, it went in a different direction of how honored I was that you guys invited me to do this. And it, it, meant, it meant the world to me. It really did. And I started thinking of that phrase, we say that sometimes, how things mean the world to us. That person meant the world to me. That group of people, they mean the world to me. And I started thinking of these, and right when I pulled into my driveway, all these thoughts bouncing through my head, I got it. I got a story. And I don't think I've ever told it in class. I hope <laughs> not. I don't think I've ever told this one. So. Those of you that know or don't know, I have two children. And uh, one's a 13-year-old, she's gonna be in the eighth grade next year. And uh, my son, who's nine years old, he's gonna be in the fourth grade next year. And the title of this story is The World for Two Dollars or Less. Now to tell the story, I have to kind of tell the end first. Uh, a couple months ago, my daughter misplaced an article of clothing and it, it, it apparently just sprouted legs and walked off. And she needed me to help her find it. So she's going all throughout the house, and I said, I'll go look in your room. So I'm in her room, and I'm looking in the hamper, and I'm looking through her dresser drawers. I don't even remember what it was. I don't even think we ended up finding it. But I'm looking through the dresser drawers, and I look on her mirror, and there's this, this greeting card stuck in the corner of the mirror. You know, all the girls, you'll put like a picture of Zac Efron right there in the corner of the mirror. <laughs> So, so, and you guys will put a picture of Zac Efron in the mirror. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, he's a good looking dude. And so, so I see this greeting card stuck in the, in the, in the mirror. And it, I've, seen a hundred, I've seen thousands of greeting cards in my life. Birthday cards, Valentine's cards. But this one caught my eye. It was a, a cheap looking generic card with a pink flower and a butterfly on it. And what caught my eye was the caption across the top. It said, thinking of you. Huh. You got a 13-year-old daughter with a card stuck in her mirror that says, thinking of you. 
Now, I didn't want to be nosy, so I decided to be curious instead. So I took the car, I took the car off the mirror and opened it up, and inside the card was a handwritten note. And as soon as I saw this handwritten note, my brain did a two-year time warp into the past. Because the handwriting was mine. I'd forgotten that I had given her this card. I'd forgotten that I had written this card. Now let's go back two years ago. I got a fifth grade little girl, kind of in that adolescent phase. And every day, one of the things I love about my job is I'm able to get home early enough to get my kids off the bus. They get off the bus and I'm there waiting. And every day, I'd be at the kitchen, maybe getting dinner ready or working on something in the house. She'd walk in the door and there's just this common thing. She walks in the door. Hey, babe, how you doing? Hi, dad. Good. And, and that just happened every day. And then she would go watch TV or go to her room or go do whatever she, done. she, she did. Well, this one day, I'm at the kitchen sink getting ready for dinner. I hear the door shut behind me. She just got off the bus. Hey, babe, how was your day? Okay. Not a good sign. So I turn around and look at her, and I could see her countenance was just low. You know, she, she was down. I'm like, you okay, babe? Yeah. Yeah, one of those types of deals. So I, I went to the kitchen island, I pulled up the two stools, and I sat down, and I said, come have a seat, come talk to me, what's the matter? And she unloads the woes that anybody who has ever gone through adolescence has gone through. This, I, this feeling of being an alien, of not belonging. Nobody understands, I'm not accepted. Um, kids were making fun of her because somebody wanted to cheat on, a, on an assignment she wouldn't help them cheat. Um, she doesn't break the rules. The kids were making fun of her on the bus, calling her a goody-goody. Uh, there was a bonfire this past weekend. All the cool kids, all the popular kids were invited. But she wasn't. And she's bawling. And I'm sitting there listening to her, and this is uncharted territory for me. This is my first child. My first adolescent child. And it's a girl, which makes it even harder. And... <laughs> Because like, I'm not, and so I can't relate. And, so, and she's unloading all this stuff on me, and I'm used to her bringing me a broken dollhouse that I can put together. I'm used to her bringing a bicycle to me that I can put a tire on it and put a new chain on it. This is a broken heart. I, I can't fix that. I can't do anything about that. And so I'm sitting there listening to her and my heart's breaking with her. And I'm trying not to cry when I'm, when I'm listening to her. And she unloads all this stuff and she goes through everything and she, <laughs> you know, she's crying the whole time. And when she's done, I put my arm around her. I didn't know what to say. I put my arm around her and I had to steal one of my brother's phrases. I said, honey, you have to understand that you have an audience of one. As long as what you do is pleasing in the sight of God, everybody else can take a long walk off a short pier. Now, I'm paraphrasing the Bible a little bit there, but that was the basic gist. <laughs> and <clears throat> so she gave me a hug. She said, thank you, Daddy. And she kind of moped her way up the stairs. Well, the rest of the night it went on. We made dinner. Our wife came home. Son came home. We had dinner, cleaned up, all that stuff. Her countenance was still low. I got up the next morning, came to school, taught all day, and, and just kind of almost forgot about it. I'm a dad. I, kind of, I just kind of forgot about it. And after school, I'm driving home, and out of nowhere, I just started thinking about it. And when I got to Lake Milton, I pulled into the pharmacy down there in Lake Milton, and I went in there and went into the greeting card section, found this cheap $2 card with a butterfly and a pink flower on it that said, thinking of you, at the top of the bottom. I'm thinking of her, so that sounds pretty good. So I took the card, went and paid $2 for it, went home before she got off the bus, and I sat down at the kitchen island, and I opened it up, and I got a pen, and I wrote this note on the inside of my daughter. It says, Laura, never forget you have an audience of one. You are beautiful, smart, 
and so, so special to me. I admire and adore you, Bill. <laughs> this is what it's like, huh, Mr. Dunn? Um, <laughs> I admire and adore you beyond description. It's the things that make you different, that make you who you are, special. I love you so much, Daddy. And I took the envelope, took, put the card in the envelope, took it up, put it on the bedroom, put, you know, put it on the pillow of the bed, came downstairs, started getting ready for dinner and everything. She comes home from school, hi, hon, hi, Dad. She walks in, starts watching TV. Well, I'd forgotten. <laughs> I'm such an idiot. I'd forgotten that I bought the car. So the evening goes on. I make dinner. Wife comes home. Kids, and your son comes home. We're, we eat dinner. After dinner, everybody kind of goes their separate ways. My wife goes and starts working on the laundry. My son goes and watches TV. My daughter goes upstairs. I go to the kitchen, and I'm putting leftovers and stuff away. And as I'm, as I'm putting the leftovers and stuff away and cleaning the kitchen, I hear coming down the stairs. And I turn around, here comes my daughter around the corner with tears in her eyes. She gives me this big hug. She says, I love you, Dad. And she turns around and ran back up the stairs. And for a second, I was like, what did I do? And I remembered the car. <laughs> 20 minutes later, she came back down the stairs, and my daughter was back. She had that smile on her face. She had that spring in her step. And the reason I called this story the world for two dollars or less is at that moment in time, on that night, to that kid, that card meant the world. And it cost me two bucks and 30 seconds of my time. And I think so often we think that to mean the world to somebody, to meet somebody's immediate need, we think that we have to do these grand gestures. We think we have to have some standing. We think we have to have some status. We have to have some pool. But it's, it's the little things. We don't have to have any status or standing. You just gotta be you. And I felt horrible when I, I feel horrible sometimes when I think, how many times on a daily basis do I have a chance to meet somebody's need? And I fail to do it because I can't get outside of myself. Or I just lack the courage. So seniors, the challenge I want to give to you is on a daily basis. I want you to seek out how you can be the world to somebody. Look for the immediate needs of the people in your world. And be the world to them. Meet their need. It could be a stupid $2 greeting card. It could be a text message. It could be a, you know, it could be a, a pumpkin latte from Dunkin' Donuts hand delivered. It could be, it could be a smile, a fist bump, a wink. You never know how meeting, when you recognize the needs of somebody and you meet that need, you can be the world to somebody. That's a challenge for me. That's a challenge for everybody. Seniors, I love you guys. I'm gonna miss you guys. And uh, you meant the world to me. Thank you.